Hi, everybody. Paul Bobnick here for Who's Mailing What. Thanks again for joining us. My guest today is Annie Arnspiker. She's with Navistone. Uh, welcome, Angie. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our viewers? Uh, tell us uh, all about yourself, uh, what you do at Navistone, um, more about Navistone. Sure. Yeah. I'm Angie Arnspiker, head of sales at Navistone. We are a five-year company or startup company out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And what we're doing is we're helping brands identify their unknown browsers so that we can turn that into the high-performing um, channel of direct mail. So we're able to identify who's coming to their website, spending time on the site. We're scoring them to really decide, you know, what is their likelihood or propensity to come back and make a purchase. And then we're able to get a direct mail piece out the door within 24 business hours so that we're still leveraging recency. We're top of mind, driving conversions back to site. Cool. Um, we'll get into more of that in a little bit, uh, but why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, about your background, what brought you to Navistone, what brought you to the world of direct mail marketing in general? Yeah. So I started my career on the agency side. I mm -hmm. spent about 14, 15 years with a company called the Hibber Group and another company called Sterling Rice Group. And it was all about the omni-channel experience. And so I don't want to date myself, but this was a while ago. But it was all about, you know, the creative, making sure the creative is good, the messaging is good, the actual print. Like I know all about the old Heidelbergs and the you know, the print process, I, I would check blue lines, you know, it was it was back in those days, but yeah. it was so great, you know, it was a comprehensive solution that we could provide for our clients way before digital advertising um, was even a sparkle in our eyes, for sure. Yeah, I, I remember all those days. Uh, it was uh, amazing how far we've come, isn't it? It absolutely is. Absolutely is. When I left that world, that sort of omni-channel print, fulfillment, direct mail world, I wanted to see the other side. So I landed at a company called Next Action back in the day, mm -hmm. and they then transitioned to, they renamed, rebranded, we became Data Logic. And then a few years after that, we became Oracle Data Cloud. Oracle actually purchased us, which was fantastic. But um, it was cool to see that side too, because it was all about the list. That was the one component that I didn't have experience in before. So understanding what outside lists were, mm -hmm. how uh, brands could leverage their profile data to get lookalike data. And so I, I have that background of the co-op world too. And so that's a very, it's, it's great to be able to see everything and how it all comes together. Right. Um, well, that sort of brings up my next question, which is uh, talking about data, right? Data is, and I've said it a billion times, that data is like the king of direct mail uh, in all shapes and forms. You know, it, it governs everything far more than, than it ever has, right? And um, direct mail basically, it, you know, is the original data-driven form of marketing, and um, what do you think that marketers still really need to do better uh, with with data? And why would they why would they want to like really maximize it? Why is it necessary? Yeah, so it's a great question, and and I think it's one that there's a lot of different philosophies on. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the right data, um, then you're, 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 it's sad. You, you need the right data, you need the right target, you need to be making sure that your advertising dollars are going to the people that it makes sense for them to get your piece. Mm -hmm. um, the data side of it though, I think there was a time where we said, oh my gosh, bring in all this data. And then it got paralyzing. There's too much data. So we don't know how to absorb it. We don't know how to model it. We, we try and I think there are people who are really very good at it but it, it got overwhelming. And so now today, I think that there's two components. One, I think you have to have AI inserted within your CRM to help get through all of that data set. I also believe that there is a great 
way or a, a necessary means to leverage more of your first party data. You know, third party cookies are going away by 2023. Um, Third party cookies are a great way to stay in front of your unknown browsers, as an example, because they're crossing, you know, tracking people across sites. But there's a, uh, there's kind of this low hanging fruit of first party data that I think brands could do a better job mm -hmm. um, understanding what it is and leveraging and targeting it. I also do think that second and third party data does come into play for sure. But I do think first party data is where the priority should be right now on focus. Right. Yeah, you kind of you kind of anticipated one of my next questions, which was about um, third party data and cookies. We know that um, due to, you know, regulations and industry practices that are changing in the next couple of years that they're going to be going away. Um, and that really, like I, like you said, it sort of like puts an emphasis now on the first and second party data. Um, so talk a little bit more about that and like what it means, especially for, uh, for retargeting. Yeah. So we, um, that's why I'm so excited about Navistone, but we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it is interesting. So when Chrome came out and said, so Google said, we're going to block all third party cookies, um, by the end of last year. And then that got extended. I think it's now by the end of 2023, yep. people did nervous, right? But nobody really highlighted the fact that what they're going to do is they are going to replace third party cookies with their own proprietary algorithm um, ID ad tracking system, right? So right. I think what that means is that walled gardens are only going to get bigger and that you're not going to have a lot of um, choices as far as ad platforms on where to serve ads. You're going to have to go with the big guys, the Googles, the Facebook, whatever it might be. Um, and don't forget that, you know, Google owns one of the largest uh, digital ad marketplaces, which is um, double click ad exchange. So I think they're setting themselves up. I think there's a there there is a means as to why they're doing this for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll say it's because of legislation and tracking and um, all of the privacy stuff. O okay, but they're going to benefit from this. Absolutely. At the end of the day. Right, right. So it's interesting. I do think that I think the stat is something like, um, is it 55 or 56 percent of ads display ads that are um, driven today on a digital ad network are from Google and Facebook. And so already they have the market share. And so that's only going to just grow. Mm -hmm. And you think, too, with, uh, you know, postage costs going up twice in a year's time and with regular increases sort of uh, seem to be penciled in for the next uh, couple of years at least that um, the emphasis on making sure that your data is clean and current and up to date as possible is more essential than ever. Yeah, I, I absolutely. With direct mail, it is imperative. You mm -hmm. absolutely need to have clean data. And you absolutely need to make sure that you're segmenting or targeting the right group and getting a message out at the right time with the right offer. Um, but don't forget that even though postage is increasing, you want to be smart about it. Mm -hmm. But that is something, a lever that you can actually turn on direct mail. On display ads, you can. I mean, I don't know how many times I've purchased something and I get a display ad couple on my screen at a time even yeah um you know for the next month right, and so right. like that it's costing you money so even though direct mail has some postage increases even though there's some paper issues right now in the world even though all of those things are happening at the end of the day direct mail is a hundred percent viewable mm -hmm. and the ad view viewability i think right now it's hovering at 49 50 percent Right. So look at the cost at, on a large scale. Direct mail is a very cost effective way to get a message seen and yeah. to the right person at the right time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that uh, that's often lost about that is that um, when we people say, well, um, email is free, digital is free, even though they know at the back of their mind that it's not really free, it may just be low cost but what are you really getting and when you really take a, a fairly 
shallow dive into the numbers and it's like it's uh you know obviously um not much of an advantage in, in a lot of ways compared to what direct mail does that's absolutely right and you know the other thing to think about especially with a, a perspective of you know making sure your brand is being seen for all the social causes and social awareness and and other things sometimes on an ad platform you don't have control on where your ad might sit it might sit next to an article that goes against what your company's values and and um, core beliefs are and so that's another benefit of direct mail you have this opportunity to really know exactly who you're targeting mm -hmm. how you're targeting them and it's going to be a tangible piece in the mail that they're going to see and so from a brand safety perspective, that's something that you forget about with direct mail. You don't have to worry about it. Um, the other thing I think is uh, the, the fraud that is, I think digital advertising is important. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the fraud and the, the click farms and the bots that are out there clicking and, you know, changing what you're reporting and your stats really yeah. truly are is something that you don't have to worry about with direct mail. You know exactly who you mail, you know exactly if they came back in and purchased, and it's a very easy one-to-one -one measurable um, channel that drives right. response that has been around hundreds and hundreds of years. Like Right, is, right. But, right? <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, it's the original data-driven data form of marketing where um, assuming that you're somebody who um, responds, but I think especially with uh, and we'll get into this in a second with talking about retargeting, but that when you respond to a direct mail piece and you have all these channels that are available, uh, we've we've written articles about this on Who's Mailing What, talking about all the different response channels and how they've grown in the last uh, few years um, to include, you know, QR codes and pearls and, um, you know, they're all they're all easily trackable. And when you can really look at the um, tools that the USPS gives you as well on the um, sending out campaign side, it's pretty impressive that you can just track these campaigns just as you would like an email campaign in real time. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It's, it's amazing. And it's, it's so great. Yeah. So um, talk, talk about, let's talk about, let's get into uh, talking about retargeting and um First of all, just define for people who aren't really familiar with it enough what uh, retargeting um, direct mail is, um, and why companies uh, why companies would want to uh, take a look at that as a way of engaging with their customers or prospects. Sure. So you know, today brands are spending it's north of two hundred and fifty billion dollars a year to drive site traffic, right? They've got all these ads out there. They're getting people to their site. And on a really, really good day, maybe 5% convert. 5%, mm. maybe it's probably closer to four, but let's say 5% convert. Right. They do what they need to do. And so what um, we're able to do is say, okay, well, that leaves this audience of 95% of people who spent time coming to the site leaving digital clues of intent throughout the site, but then for whatever reason, they abandon and you don't know who they are. So what direct mail retargeting can do is it can take those people that have spent a few minutes on the site, that have browsed different categories, that have done different activities, and we can match them 65, 70% of the time to a postal name and address. Once we understand who we can match of those unknown browsers. So remember, these are unknown browsers. There's no other way to get in front of them other than digital retargeting, which are those ads that follow you around the web. Right. I okay. look at those, I look at the big red boots. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, big red boots are following me everywhere. Right, right. For a month or so, yeah. For a month or so. Even right. after I took <laughs> Right. And so... Um, this retargeting allows you to, one, not only understand exactly at a PII level, a uh, name and address, who is on your site, but then two, understanding what the browsing behavior was. Are they a looky-loo? They'll never buy. Our models can tell you that. 
Right. Or are they somebody who's very serious about buying? They're just doing other research or whatnot. And maybe a direct mail piece is going to, you know, tra- take them over the edge and have them come back and convert. Mm-hmm. And so that's what direct mail retargeting is. We can take those unknown browsers. We score them. We identify an audience depth and we mail them out. Right now, we're mailing out um, first class mail the next business day. And it's a postcard. But you can do any kind of format. You just you want to leverage recency and you don't want to um, let those names get stale. But get the piece out, get it out right away. And then because our process starts with a first party cookie, we don't expect an impact to these changes that we spoke about earlier. Yeah. Um, that come into how our reach is. I think our reach is going to be pretty consistent because we're starting with a first party cookie. And then also, I think that we are able to really get those people that are interested in your brand back to convert rather than just purchasing an outside list of somebody who may or may not know your brand. Right. So how about uh, personalization? Is there uh, a good degree of personalization that's involved as well? Yeah. So on the Navistone side, I'm sure there's others that do this as well, but on the Navistone side, we are able to personalize, of course, its name and address, Mm -hmm. but also by category, make it relevant, direct mail. You want this piece to talk to whoever it is on the other side in a way that they want to be talked to. So as much information as you know about them, um, what their category interests are, If they've ever bought from you before, maybe they were a last buyer from five years ago, you probably want to talk to them differently than a brand new to file um, prospect. And so those kinds of things absolutely should be personalized. We at Navistone, we actually do print on demand. So Mm -hmm. we're able to worry about inventory levels and printing shells and then imprinting name and address. This is all printed on demand. Um, and that's how we're able to do the turn and the personalization. But yes, personalization is key. Um, we can even get down to unique promo codes if you want to do something like that. Um, we can, on the front of the piece, we can talk to the person by you know, putting in their name to make it a little bit even more personalized on the message front. But yeah, it's, it's very personal. For right, sure. right. Yeah, because there are different classes of um, uh, different uh, segments of buyers and, and and prospects past prospects even so you can like look at somebody and say well um you know i you, you, we're going to give these people 10 percent off whereas somebody else especially like you said if it's a past buyer that you're able to match back they can get 25 percent. welcome back please come back yeah absolutely absolutely that's a great way to do it mm-hmm. the other thing you can do you know is um we are leveraging the intent and we know that they were on the site and we know what they viewed. But mm-hmm. as an added layer, if the um, opportunity presents itself, we can overlay some demographics too. Right. So if it's financial services offer, you know, we could look at credit risk scores or household income, or if it's a cruise offer and, and it's really targeted to people who are maybe retired so that they can spend a month on the water it's, you know, we could apply overlays um, to absolutely narrow that group down. The caution there is that we find intent data is stronger than any of those data, you know, demographic overlays that you could, or purchase lists that you could um, apply. Right. But you can absolutely, you know, once what we usually do is say, let's get a baseline and then let's overlay some of those other things to see if there's something that can create a list. Right. Yeah, because, you know, I think, like you said, that uh, recency is um, people, you know, when they shop, everybody has different shopping habits and patterns. But if you're, um, you know, a very serious buyer about something and you know you're going to get bombarded by once you log into Facebook or you're looking at other um, sites and you get the cookies that pop up and they're bombarding you, a piece of mail that you get like the next day that reminds you that you were looking at um, like red boots, all of a sudden it's like something that's tangible, physical, it's right there. Um, and it's not some sort of, you know, fluff that gets in your, it, stuck in your inbox. Or like I said, when you log in other sites, so it stands out so much better. That's right. Absolutely. It's relevant. Mm-hmm. It's relevant at the time. So 
I, I agree. And I, I have to say, I, I think, you know, people appreciate the tangibleness, as you mentioned, you know, right. it's a couple of minutes away from the screens. It's you're outside, you're checking your mail. It's an event, especially during COVID. I think people were very excited to be able to get out of their house and check oh, their yeah. mail. Mm -hmm. You know, the statistics show that people are checking their mail every day and if not daily, weekly, but it's, it's something that people look forward to. And it's always fun to get a letter or to get something that talks to you. And so right. the mail piece is a perfect fit for that. You could probably, I, I think, uh, as well do like an informed delivery campaign if you wanted to. Absolutely, you could. Yeah. You know, I, I think those are really great. If um, I check my informed delivery every single day, and I'm yeah, like, what so. am I getting? What am I getting? I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And if there was a coupon code or a special offer, I can actually go to the store or online and purchase before I have the physical piece on, in hand. Right. So that is another really great touch point for sure. Oh. A great session that people should not forget about. A right. good point. And especially using the uh, postcard format for that, because uh, pretty much any postcard, uh, except probably like, you know, super jumbo or whatever, but anything smaller than that, um, six by nine, especially, um, they they will pop up in your informed delivery um, stream. And then you can just go from there with, like you said, without even physically pulling it out of your mailbox or, you know, off the floor when it gets delivered. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I think it's fantastic. I've even seen some, um, I've gotten a couple uh, mailers. We recently moved. And so we're getting a lot of, you know, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, here's uh, pest control. Here's windows. Here's siding. All of these. And a lot of them have actually implemented links in the informed delivery. I don't know if you've seen that before. Yeah. Where you can click on it and go right to the site. And so it's a very clever, clever way of, um, you know, leveraging that informed delivery channel. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, it's, it's really, um, uh, there's so many possibilities with it. And, uh, and as I just mentioned too, when you have the um, U.S. Postal Service with the last postage increase, um, basically gave a lot of marketers an incentive to use um, a six by nine postcard at the first class uh, mail bulk rate. Um, such a, a great postage savings and you get the additional benefits of mailing at uh, first class instead of marketing mail. So if you're doing a, you know, a retargeting campaign or you're constantly retargeting people, um, that postcard stands out when they physically feel it and get it as well as in the um, informed delivery. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Our um, our clients were so excited about that additional size. You know, it was like, okay, postage increase, that's fine. But look at this size. You know, we get more real estate in the in the mailbox. There are more apps to add a QR code. There's just a little bit more space to to really get the message and, and the creative out. So yeah, we've got a lot of thrilled customers to um, to the USPS. They're thrilled that that came to be for sure. Right. So in general, like about direct mail, um, talking about uh, retail mail and brick and mortar uh, retailers, especially, um, you know, with, you know, the continuing pandemic and everything, it's like thinking about ways of getting people into into physical stores is a little bit of a challenge, right, compared to before we had before. Um, so what kind of things would you say that like retailers in general, but maybe even especially um, brick and mortar companies uh, should do to, with their direct mail to be more appealing and bring people in. Yeah. So even before, so pre-COVID, let's say, yeah. I know that brick and mortar was really um, heavily focused on an experience. It right. needs to be an experience. You know, why am I coming into the store when I can just go to Amazon and find what I want? Yeah. And I do think with COVID, um, obviously, it, it accelerated the e-commerce and the, the way in which companies brick and mortar are online. So now in Amazon, I, I'll go to the Macy's.com site because they've done a great job in, in changing, 
changing that up and making it easy. Um, from a direct mail standpoint, though, I do think that making sure that um, your direct mail pace is personalized with the local store, you know, whatever that is, if it's a drive time or a, just a radius around each store, it should be highlighted. It should say your closest Macy store is at this mall. Here are the hours. Here's a little map. Make it as easy as possible to know so people know exactly where they need to go. And then I think having promotions and offers on the card that they can redeem in store is another great one that, um, you know, I see those all the time. While I, my point of view is make an offer that is accessible either online or in store. And by the way, make it expire at the same time too. I think from a consumer perspective, that's what I prefer, but from a brand perspective, perspective, I think you can maybe have some promotions to have redeemed in store to help drive that store traffic for mm -hmm. sure. Um, one of the things that we can do at Navistone is we can take in store transactions as well as the online transactions we're, we're seeing, bump that up against who we've been mailing to so that you do have a comprehensive matchback or view of um, what the direct mail piece has done for you, whether it's in store or online. So we have added that component into all of our reporting to make sure that that accessibility is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that as being hugely important, which, you know, it just is, it doesn't have to be a really long pro process so you can really understand where your uh, store traffic and your customers are coming from much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, looking ahead a little bit, um, are there any trends or uh, thoughts about what's coming like uh, in the next year or so? Anything that sort of stands out as um, something that is going to be, um, you know, we're all gonna be talking about? Yeah. So, you know, I just came back from my first in-person conference a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. And one, it was very fun to be in person. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, I do think that there was a lot of discussion about leveraging direct mail and specifically QR codes to help capture first party data. Okay. And mm -hmm. third party data, right? So the thought being is that QR codes have come a long way since their beginnings. If you remember at the beginning, people could not use them. They they had to download something on their phone. We were barely getting used to the phones. It just it wasn't, it wasn't rolled out nicely, but nowadays everybody's using them. If you want to go eat, you've got to scan the QR code, you know, for the menu. So every phone has the capability now. And I think what, um, what we see is that people are willing to scan those and then they're willing to give you data. So you have first party data yep. as a result of that. So right. send out the direct mail pieces, leverage QR codes to make it easy to get back to site or a form or wherever you want it to be. And your consumers or prospects, they are going to complete that for you because they want relevant advertising from you or relevant messaging from you in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. I mean, I think it's something that um, um, it's really still like an untold, uh, um, unsung opportunity for a lot of marketers. And yeah. uh, you know, you don't get the uh, quizzical looks from people when they see QR codes uh, anymore, especially people uh, below, I'd say, 65 or so. It seems, it's, you know, uh, they're everywhere and people, like you said, now know, know how to use them. Right. They are. And I don't know if you've noticed, but it, when you go into your local grocery store even or your convenience store, your 7-Eleven, Brands are leveraging those QR codes. Learn oh, yeah. here or enter this, you know, <laughs> enter this contest here or whatever it might be. And so, yeah, I think we'll see more and more of those. Well, I think it's it's like what you said. It's with uh, customer experience, and um, it's in a broader sense, like with the customer experience, whether you're, you're in store and you have the QR code to scan, or uh, you get the direct mail piece. It's looking at it from the user standpoint and saying, okay. Um, rather than something that takes you to a static, um, not mobile optimized website like you used to, now you get something that's a, um, a real, um, you know, more um, 
robust uh, mobile experience. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. It's cool. It's very cool. So, uh, so wrapping up, um, what's your what are your thoughts about basically like what the the value proposition is of direct mail? Like, why does it still work? Why does it still mean something? Why is it still um, why is it still you know uh, such a vital part of marketing? I I think that um, consumers are overwhelmed with all the display ads being pushed in front of them multiple times over and over and over again. And again, sometimes multiple times on one screen even. I think that's part of it. I think email um, is the same. We're seeing a high rate of people unsubscribing. And I think it's because they're getting a hundred emails a day and it's not necessary that they necessarily that they want to unsubscribe from the brand. They want to unsubscribe from the channel of emails because their inbox is getting full. And so I, I believe that direct mail, you know, right now, I think it's, it's like a $44 billion industry. That's right. Like a little bit more, right? And so I, I expect that people are going to see that direct mail is a great way to get outside all that clutter. While you still need some of that for nurturing, absolutely. Sure. But direct mail is a great way to get outside that clutter and talk to your, your consumer, your prospect in a way that they want to be talked to in a relevant, very um, respectful, tangible, personalized manner. And so I, I think that I think there's a big opportunity here to not only grow new to file, to grow your file, but also for reactivation and leveraging direct mail just has always worked since, you know, when were the first circulars out or, or like the first Montgomery Ward catalog, you know, back in 1872. That sounds right. Yeah. Something like that. You know, direct. I think New York Life was one of the first to do direct mail campaigns back Mm -hmm. in the 1870s or something, and they still do direct mail campaigns today. A lot. And the reason it works. It works. Right. And so I do think more and more people are going to um, not necessarily abandon digital, and you shouldn't. But I do think that people are going to be more investigated into this whole direct mail thing. And what what is it? It's a high performing channel and it consistently is. And if you look at the bigger brands, they usually rely on on this channel when sales are down. And there's a reason for that. Right. And so with the paper shortages and the paper issues, I do think that catalog is going to be cut back a bit. But I do think you can get your message across with a trifles or a, a postcard. And so bridge recency, get it out the door. And I think that this is going to be a channel that continues to grow. Awesome. Well, that sounds like a great place, a uh, great note to end on. Um, people want to get in touch with you, uh, Navistone.com. That's right. Yeah. Um, awesome. It's my first letter is my name and last name. So A. Arnspiker at Navistone.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, it was uh pretty awesome i I think that uh uh there are a lot of opportunities and as you've shown us with uh retargeting mail especially um this is uh really one of the um big growth areas that i think is uh uh, an area of opportunity so thanks again for uh, joining us today thank you always good to talk to you paul we'll talk to you soon okay thanks bye-bye